Thank you so much. Uh, who here is a fan of CSS? I, th I thought I heard some boos. <laughs> like JavaScript developers in the room. Like, I think CSS is awesome. I think using CSS to do layout is the way you should do it. But when I first learned CSS and how to do CSS for layouts, it was, it's hard. It's so hard. You're like, ooh, CSS color. Ooh, nice fonts. Yes, I get it. Layout. I have no idea what I am doing. <laughs> How many of you had to, had to do that with floats and like hand coding float base, clearing floats, right? Like, guess what? Those days are over. And this is why I think it's never been a better time to be a newbie for any of you in the room who like literally have never done any of this. You are at an advantage, actually, right now. I gave this talk at an event apart Seattle uh, a month ago. Everything you know about web design just changed, telling everybody who like is into web design. Some of my biggest heroes in the web design space, the people I learned from years ago, were there. A couple of them came up to me after separately and said the same thing, which is, oh, the new people have such an advantage right now. They were like really kind of freaked out, like I wish I knew nothing at the moment <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to have to go unlearn all this stuff and that unlearning stuff is hard. You don't have to unlearn anything if you haven't, those of you who haven't learned it yet, you don't have to learn the old crappy hacks, maybe you haven't mastered them yet but you're trying to, yeah don't bother. <laughs> And you're not going to get stuck in the old models of thinking. You actually do have an advantage because you can come to this with fresh eyes and fresh ideas. Plus, right now, no one knows anything, actually. Like, this stuff got invented, but it's almost like it's, it came from God, and we're scientists, and we need to discover what was created. <laughs> we haven't, uh, even me, like, I don't actually know what this material is yet. We don't know yet what this stuff can do. So all the things that you might have heard, like, always do this, don't ever do that, yeah. Those rules are all gone, obliterate all of them. We actually don't know. And you can become an expert quickly, quickly, in like a year or two, by leapfrogging. You can leapfrog over all these bros who keep tweeting me about how wrong I am about everything. <laughs> because they're, I don't know, dragging their feet, they're scared, there's something, they're just, they're used to these old ideas and you can just be like, yep, whatever, boink, and get ahead of them. Get a job, become an expert very quickly. I'm really serious. This doesn't happen very often. It's happening right now with layout and with CSS. So I want to talk a little bit about the history to give you all some context about what is going on with layout and why I think this is a pivotal moment. This might be what some of you have as your idea of how layout works on the web. It just has always worked the way it always has. Yeah, it's not, that's not true. Or maybe you have this idea of like responsive. Responsive is the way you do it now, and it was a new thing at some point, so there must have been something before that, something, uh, and that's what the timeline looked like. But really, that's not what it looked like either. It's looked like this. There's been multiple models of how to do layout on the web. Specifically, I'm talking about layout. How do you do that on the web? There's been a bunch of different models and they've changed through the years. It started with simple HTML, where you just had HTML. CSS did not exist. JavaScript certainly did not exist. You just had HTML. If you wanted to change the font color or size, you like wrote attributes on your HTML elements. Really awful, awful, awful code. But we, it started with this basic idea, and I'm showing it to you because this is still the fundamental layout model of the web. If you do nothing, this is what you get. So you have a headline that is in a box. Everything is secretly a box according to the browser and that box is just going to be the whole width that it has available, whether it looks like it or not, it's going to kind of fill up the space. If you have a paragraph, the same thing is happening and as there's less space, those boxes are getting narrower, things are wrapping and as there's more space, they're unwrapping. Um, and then if you had an image, that image, this image, is there's no CSS here except for those purple boxes. There's no CSS being applied, so the image is just the size it is. It is its own intrinsic size. It, whatever it came out of Photoshop or wherever it came from, whatever size it was born, that's the size it is on the page. And so you end up with things like overflow because it, it, it doesn't really grow or shrink. It just kind of is the way it is. So that idea, if you inserted another paragraph or you made a headline longer, then all the other things after it would sort of scoot down to make space for what appeared. It's kind of like how Microsoft Word works or Google Docs or whatever. Like that model is what I 
want us to now call the flow model, flow layout. If you don't do anything, you're going to have flow layout. That's the basic building block of understanding layout on the web. And so back in the day when that was the only thing that you could have on an HTML page, the layouts kind of looked like this. They were just very, very simple. Um, you could center things, exciting text align center, or it had different syntax then, but you could have images, you could put images next to each other. So people tried to do some interesting things, but there wasn't really a lot you could do. And then we had tables. So tables in HTML were born in order to hold data because some data should be shown in a table. That is what you should use an HTML table for today. HTML tables are awesome when you have tabular data. But graphic designers came along and they went, aha, <laughs> I can put text things next to each other if I pretend that it's data in a table. And a whole era was born of using HTML tables in order to accomplish layouts, which you may have heard you should never do. It's not because tables are evil. It's because using HTML to do styling is evil. <laughs> So that was the HTML table era, and it lasted far longer than it should have, but you know, life moved on. And, but in this era, we had this idea, this sort of beginning of the idea, like, oh, how do you make a website? You open a Photoshop, you draw a picture of the website that you want, you write a bunch of code, it doesn't really matter what kind of code, it's actually in that time it was really, really bad code, and then you got a website out the other end. That was the idea. The good thing about this era is that it had a lot of creativity. We were doing all kinds of things with web design, because a lot was coming over from desktop publishing, a lot of People were excited about the web, and they didn't really care about the quality of code. They cared about making something beautiful and artistic, and that communicated really well. Then we came the era of Flash. And not Flash for an ad or for a little thing, but in Flash for the whole website. We were, for a little while, we were building the entire website in Flash. Uh, that era also lasted longer than maybe it should have. And you, when you use Flash, which is a program now, uh, I guess Adobe still runs it? I don't know if it even is still alive. But at the time it was Macromedia, or actually before Macromedia bought it, it was its own independent company. The first thing you needed to do was tell the program what size to make the stage. You created a stage, and then that was the size. So your site was this fixed size, that fixed stage. And then you'd place items into it. You would make little objects. You'd make objects the way you maybe do today in Sketch or something, where you place them on the page. You could then use animation to move them around and have different sequences of things happening, or things hap you know, somebody would click on something and something would happen. But basically, you were making the entire web page exist in this little, in this box, in this stage. And in fact, if you wanted scrolling, you had to make your own scroll bars. I do not recommend making your own scroll bars. It, do not make, use the browser scroll bars. They're very, 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 very hard to make. And only a very few people in the world know how to make scroll bars properly. It was a huge problem. <laughs> browser people made them for you, so use theirs. Uh, it also meant that it didn't matter how big the web window was, there was sort of nothing in the web window and the Flash movie was sort of floating in the middle, maybe with some text underneath that said, if you don't have Flash, then too bad for you. <laughs> the layout model in this era, though, was very much the layout model that you see in Sketch today, or Illustrator, or Freehand if you used it back in the day, or Superpaint like I did, or this is from MacDraw, because it goes back to the 80s, where like you make a thing, you put it on the page, and it stays where you put it. Like, pfft. That's how InDesign works. That's how the real world works. When you like cut some text out that came out of the photo typesetting machine, you ran it through a wax machine, and you glued it down on a paste-up board, it stayed where you put it, if the wax didn't melt. It stayed where you put it. That model is very, very attractive. We wish it kind of worked that well, I mean, that's why we use Sketch and such. But that's not how the web wants to work. And so Flash, goodbye. What we ended up with, what we need, what really is the appropriate medium for the web is CSS, right? So you use CSS, you have the separation of concerns where you're able to use HTML for your content, for your form elements, for your buttons, for your interfaces, whatever. That's HTML. And then your CSS gives you the look, the feel, the styling, if the person has CSS. They might be using reader mode or pocket or Instapaper. Maybe the CSS gets, falls off. But most of the time, they're going to get CSS. You use JavaScript for all sorts of other things. But this separation of concerns was an uh, was, um, idea that came along in the era of web standards, where we said, oh, OK, um, yeah, the quality of the code, the quality of the HTML without anything else attached to it is actually really important. It matters for people with disabilities. It matters if you're using a screen reader. It matters if you're wanting to tab through the page. It matters if you're. Um, 
you're reusing the same styling over and over again in a content management system. It matters if it's, you want to show up in the Google search results. That's one of the biggest reasons that Flash went away is because all of that content was invisible to Google and so therefore never showed up in Google search results. Um, so there's an example of the bad code and the good code. Semantic markup, super important if you haven't really learned about it or how to use HTML. It's not technically complicated, but it is a set of, it's sort of like the English major part of coding where you just sort of know what things are and you use the right semantic element at the right time. It's like learning more vocabulary words. Um, but CSS came along with this model called absolute positioning. How many people have tried to absolutely position things using position relative, position? How many people like absolutely positioning things? Right, there are good, <laughs> There are good use cases for it. There are good moments, and there's nothing wrong with using it. There are, we'll continue to use it. But you know what? I was at a conference last year. The two men who invented CSS, they wrote the CSS specification, um, Bert Boss and Halcon Lee. Uh, the moderator asked the question, is there anything that you should have not put in CSS at all? <laughs> and Halcon Lee answered, absolute positioning. <laughs> So it's, I gave it this little tiny uh, moment on the timeline because it was sort of a thing for a moment. But it, it didn't work out. It was sort of a, that mental model of like when you put something somewhere, it's going to stay where you put it. And that's not really actually, it just, it, it breaks flow. If you take something, if you absolutely position something or you position it, uh, one of the other ones, it, like, it's no longer part of the flow. And so you no longer can you know, add content and have things move around the way you need them to. So what we ended up doing for a very long time is floats. Uh, fluid layouts using floats is a big part of it, right? So we had fluid layouts where um, we could take the first two parts of this the, and put them in a wrapper and take the rest of the content and put it in a wrapper and we'll take the first set of content and float it left. We'll take the rest of the content and we'll float it right, uh, which is sort of how we were doing this in the early days. Um, and you can squish them, make them go back and forth, right? Uh, here's a, a kind of classic layout that we did in that era where um, the problem with this though, and the designers came along and I was one of them, and we were like, I was like, this just looks ugly too often. The line length of the text gets way too long. There's this awkward space on the side of the photo that just sort of hangs out there. Um, y yuck. <laughs> so a lot of us came along and said, well, let's just, let's just fix the width of things. If you fix the width of things, then you can make the image be the same width as the text is going to be and you won't have awkward things. You can make the line length of the text be whatever you want it to be. It's great. The only problem is, of course, that we don't know how big the web window is. And it's not really of the web when it's a fixed size and the web is not. And when phones came along, people were like, oh, man, we're in a, we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> this is not working out. But meanwhile, in that era, this is when this idea came along around 2006 to say, the correct w way to make a web page is to make a 12 columns. They should all be 120 pixels wide, and, or 60 pixels wide, and we'll have a grid like this. And everybody started doing wireframes kind of like this. And it just became this thing that this is what a web page looks like. It was not like this for the first decade or in a decade and a half. It became like that later. And we still kind of live with the residual effects of that in so today. But there's the, there's the thing, so right, so like from like 2000 to 2010, there was this giant battle of HTML tables versus CSS, fluid versus fixed, and maybe you're still doing Flash. Um, and then mobile came along, and all the fluid people said, yeah, I told you so. And all the fixed people said, okay, I'll make a responsive site because I can make it pretty at all the points. And uh, Steve Jobs came along and killed Flash, apparently. Uh, <laughs> And the table-based people were already, those people weren't using tables anymore. Um, and so we ended up entering this responsive era. And when I made this graph, I realized, gosh, you know, the responsive era has actually now been around for quite a long time compared to some of these other models. It's been around longer than other ideas that we held very religiously. Maybe it really is time that we have a different idea of what's going on. Like maybe it's not a bad idea if we evolve past responsive. Um, but responsive, so here's responsive, here's my examples from responsive for those of you who maybe want to see visually how this worked out, right? So the image is going to grow and shrink with the amount of space that's available. We could add a breakpoint and drop the sidebar at a certain point. Um, and we kind of took that idea of what a wireframe should be and we just started doing this thing where like we had three wireframes, desktop, tablet, mobile, maybe it's 12 columns, eight columns, four columns, and that's the proper way to do, like it's, 
I don't know that that's the proper way to do it. It's a worry that worked for a long time. There's reasons maybe to still do this, but um, there are other things we could do as well. But meanwhile, we got like, because the math is so hard on all the floating and all that. If you want to do anything that's besides a side, like a main content column and a sidebar, if you want to do anything else, it starts to get really hard and you got negative margins and it's too much time. It's not worth it. So we started using a lot of frameworks like Bootstrap and we ended up in this world where like, <laughs> all the websites start to look the same. So I have been researching um, CSS Grid, Flexbox, all of these new technologies that are coming along. And over the last year or two, especially last fall, I started to get to this place. I realized all last year I was in my head thinking, oh, it's responsive, but better. Oh, it's responsive, but more exciting. Oh, it's responsive, we got some new superpowers. And if I, at some point I realized it's not actually responsive web design. This is actually a new era. And maybe we need a new word for this new era. So four weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, I coined the term intrinsic web design. You're the only second audience that I've talked to about this in life in person. <laughs> Hello. So I think, I think it's a good idea to have a word. It helped a lot to go into a meeting and say, do we want to do this fixed or do we want to do this fluid? And you didn't have to explain it all. You just sort of had this idea of kind of what bucket you were going to end up with. Or, oh, we should switch to responsive, um, a responsive layout. So I think having a word to sort of mean, not just grid, but all the new stuff is helpful. Because it is flow. I mean, a majority of what we're going to do is still using the flow layout, Flexbox, CSS grid multi-column from way back in the day. I think it was in CSS1 multi-column. We could be using it. Uh, and really, we have all this CSS, lots and lots and lots of different properties and different superpowers and tools and such that we can be using. Um, so in the minutes, the few minutes I have to show you, I want to show you um, kind of two things, one about images and one about columns, and sort of some of the ways that this stuff looks different and, and feels different. And whether you're writing code, you'll want to learn the code. But also, if you're a designer, and a designer who, like, doesn't ever want to touch code, like, okay, that's fine. But you also need to understand how this stuff works because it's different, it works differently. It's like a different material that we have for us. Um, so fixed images, like pre-responsive web design, you have an image, in this case, the image is in a pink box, and then that box is in an orange box, which is in a, a wrapper box, which is blue, and it just is the size that it is, right? It just is. Fluid images, the other option we've been using a lot is we put, say, a width of 100% on it. So it becomes 100% of the containing box that it's in. And if the containing box gets narrower, then it gets narrower. And if the containing box gets wider, it gets wider. It also gets taller or shorter at the same time, which you may or may not want. We've been living with that reality with no choice, but maybe that's not what we always want. Maybe we want to set a height and a width well, what happens? Oh, we squish him. <laughs> we can't squish him. That's terrible. That's not acceptable. So I'm a big proponent of using this newish property called object fit. And you can use object fit cover to then have a result where he doesn't get squished. Um, what will happen is the box that is the size of the image sort of gets separated from the image itself. And as the image is resized, then it gets cropped, it crops the image here. It crops the image instead of squishing the image. And you can, in this case, it's cropping on a, oh, it's not actually cropping on a 50, 50, like 50%, 50% center point. I actually moved the point down a little bit to be more where the camera is. So you can sort of move that point around. It doesn't always work for every use case because if you have a content management system, that might get complicated. But I think there's situations where we can use object fit cover. And it can look really beautiful. And then you can control the layout and the graphic design better. I have an entire video about this and how it works up on YouTube in my channel that they mentioned. Your layout lands. It's one of the videos. You can check it out. Um, and I take more than like 90 seconds to explain it. Uh, and then tracks. So CSS Grid has tracks. It has columns. It also has rows. So for the very first time in CSS, we're able to define rows and place items in rows and maybe even skip a row and leave white space. Um, responsive web design, we used, it wasn't technically really columns, but we ended up with the effect of columns by sizing the content in percents of widths. And everything squishes at the same rate. So it works like this, where if you have three things and you've put percents on them, then they all sort of get smaller at the same time and they all get bigger at the same time, right? Like that's what we're used to. But with grid, we actually have multiple ways to define what's going on. So we've got FR units, we've got min-max, we've got fixed size, and we've got auto. And so you can, in fact, uh, 
it, it works differently. So here, the FR, we have four FR, one FR columns, and these are all going to squish at the same time. A little bit different thing happens when they're too small, but it's very similar. We can also instead say one FR, two FR, four FR, six FR. And if you notice what's happening is when the one FR column gets to a point where that it would start overflowing that word that's highlighted in yellow, it stops shrinking. And then the two FR will get small until it would start to overflow. And it doesn't overflow and it starts. So the shrinking happens, like different columns are shrinking a different amount at different times in order to make sure that we never end up with overflow, but we proportion the space out in the way that we said. Like this is subtly different, but it's actually different than using percents. Or here, I've got three columns that are one FR, and I've got one column that's set in a min max. So the FR columns shrink all the way down to their min content size, and then the min max column starts to shrink. So there's actually two stages. The FR columns shrink first, and the min max stays at its max until all the FR columns have used, have, 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 don't have any extra space anymore, and then it starts to shrink down. Or here, I've thrown in a fixed size, because you can actually also make one of your columns be a fixed pixel size, which you can't really do in responsive design. So that first column doesn't change size at all. Or here, I've got auto involved. Auto is a big hog. Auto is just like, I'm going to take all the extra space up. So the FR column never grows and shrinks. The FR column is always at its min content size. It's complicated, and in four minutes is not enough time to explain it. But this stuff is interesting to me. Like, what does it mean to design something that has this fluidity and this flexibility model that's much more complex than what we could do in responsive web design? And what do we, what do we want to do with it? I literally don't know, think there's a person in the world who has an answer to that question yet. We all need to go out and kind of play with it and see and start designing real world projects to find out the answer to that. Um, I have three videos that I just put up uh, the last couple weeks about what is FR units, what is min max, and what is uh, the other one? Uh, main content and max content to kind of show you how those things interplay with each other, how they work together. So intrinsic web design, I also was on a podcast with Jeffrey Zeldman recently where we chatted about it for about an hour, ideas about what this means for design in the industry. Um, here's my YouTube channel with a ton of videos. There's also a series about how to write CSS that will work in every browser at the same time because, of course, the very first thing that everybody wants to know, as soon as you say, hey, there's cool new stuff, everybody goes, what about IE? <laughs> Seven part series to answer that question. You can write code that works in new browsers and in old browsers at the same time if you just know how to do it. So watch those videos and then you'll know how to do it. Um, all these demos are up at labs.jensimmons.com as well as a whole bunch of others. And please come say hi to me. It's my favorite thing about being a speaker is that I don't have to um, get out of my shy bubble because you come and say hi to me. Um, <laughs> so if you're feeling shy, Come say hi anyway. Um, <laughs> or you can say it on Twitter and I'll follow you. Um, thank you. All right, good job.